Hold on, start. All right, we're recording. Um, okay. Yeah, I do. I did. Uh, got some. Got now we're recording. Got some lighting, better lighting. Put some black on either side of the American flag. New camera, new microphone. You look good. Ooh. Looking good. Thank you, sir. I'm uh, moving on up. But all right, we were supposed to do a couple weeks ago, but because I'm an idiot and didn't read it. Now we are friends of the family, which will be will be on Audible or not on Audible. We'll be in the description, sticking in the top comment. Points deducted because it's not on Audible. Don't want to do that to you, but I have to. Well, uh, you know that was before the Audible thing was really uh, really in vogue, you know. So um, excuses. Yes, that's it's, that's what happened. Yeah, but it is, uh, and I say this as a as a good thing. It's definitely one of the uh, most fucked up books I've ever read. <laughs> It's definitely, it's, it. I mean, it, you said it. Well, you mentioned it in, uh, in when you talked about the body snatchers in your other book, Crooked Brooklyn, which is on Audible for everybody listening and anybody that like me plays video games. Grand Theft Auto Four. It reminds me a lot of Grand Theft Auto Four. And then reading this book, Friends of the Family, it. I just believe that even more now. It sounds like like fictional shit, but just having your cops having the mob having their cops on the payroll and just saying because that's one thing you can do in the video game is you can get in a cop car get a cop's uniform the mob tells you hey look up bobby bag of donuts you put it into the computer system you go there you flash your lights you're like sorry man you got a ticket and he blows brains out but that's actually what happened that's actually what happened in real life well that happened with these guys yeah absolutely absolutely they um you know if you if you um if you remember back to the uh, the beginning, we didn't talk a lot about this or write a lot about this in the book, but these guys had were doing this, uh, and that's Eppolito and Caracappa, are the name mm-hmm. of the two the two detectives. I mean, they weren't they were doing this well before they got involved with the uh, the cases that we broke the you know broke the investigation open with. Um, yeah. They had been working for the Gambinos before, and um, and they had been passing along information and, and doing the same kinds of things they did with the uh, Lucchese family, yeah. which is who they ultimately hooked up with with uh, through Gas Pipe Castle. Yeah. So so these guys were veterans at this thing. They um, and the reason that they moved from the Gambinos to the Lucchese was because um, Eppolito's cousin was a wise guy with the uh, Gambino family and they killed him for some reason. I forgot the reason why, but they killed him. So he was, um, you know, he got pissed off and, uh, and decided that he wasn't going to help them anymore. And fortunately they hooked up with a guy named Kaplan and that was the, um, that put them on to gas pipe Casso, who was a Lucchese, I guess at that point, kind of co underboss, um, I don't, he was not the boss. He was on the lamb at various times. So he was, uh, but he was way up there in the family. And, mm-hmm. um, and, and he called them his crystal ball. Yeah. Because he was able to, you know, to kind of uh, look in and find out who was doing what through their eyes, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. It, it definitely had some elements that reminded me of The Departed. I'm sure you've seen that movie, right? Yeah. 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 Exactly. You know, when they're, when they're going to the warehouse and they're given the fake, like, cruise missile computer chips to the Chinese mafia and yeah. their inside guy says like no phones and the they're using the Patriot Act to watch everyone and all of a sudden all the phones shut off and he's like please tell me Chinamen did not just get into that car but you talked yeah. about how right going up in investigations all of a sudden phones just go dead disappear off the map and they're like what just happened everyone there just digitally went into the void just vanished right 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 yeah well you know, the interesting thing about it is that one of the early murders that these guys did um, occurred in a garage, in a in a, a, an automobile garage, you know, a, a repair a repair shop. Yeah. And um, and after they killed um, a guy who gas pipe thought was a um, was an informant. Um, he they then had to break up the cement in the gar- garage. They got the poor schmuck. Who was the owner of the garage to break up the get uh, break up the floor, and then uh, put this guy in and then re uh, cement it over, you know, and um, and it and it wasn't until we got involved much later on, and then the feds got involved that they were able to uh, you know to get that that tear up that floor and uh, and you know and find the remains of this guy. So um, so it's interesting. There was a garage involved in this. So yeah, 
But I mean, even how the book starts and it's just, you know, you go up and I mean, the way, and this isn't spoiling it for anybody listening, but the way they go up and it's just, yeah, you kind of walk up on either side and it's, what's that on the ground? I thought what they were going to do is scream gun, but no, it was even worse. They're like, what's that on the ground? A guy bends over and just pow, 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 pow. Yeah. It's, that was, um, that was Eddie Lino. Yeah. So, you know, you know, you, the one thing I got to tell your audience that this is kind of a, uh, this whole hour part of this was in, 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 it, it involved kind of a domino kind of effect that goes back to the, um, the killing of Paul Castellano by Gamb- by, uh, by John Gotti and, uh, and, and Sammy de Bull Gravano. Mm-hmm. They kill him because Gotti wants to take over the Gambino family. And um, they don't get permission, which is one of the rules of the mafia, that in order to, mm-hmm. to hit a made guy, and let alone a boss, you need to get the okay from the ruling commission. They did not get it. They just did it as, as they want, you know, they will want to do. You know, Gotti was a cowboy. Gravano was a cowboy. So they just set this up and they kill him. Now that set off a series of events with Gas Pipe Castle and the Lucchese family, the um, Vincent de Chin Giganti and the um, and the Bana- and the um, the Genovese, yeah, the Genovese family. They said this can't stand. We can't allow this to happen because you know they're thinking of themselves. One of them could get killed one day. Yeah. So um, so what happens is they they give the okay, they meaning the commission, give the okay for gas pipe to kill John Gotti. And, um, and I get this story after the fact directly from gas pipe castle. I go to visit him down in federal prison in Butner, North Carolina, because he sends word up through another informant that I had that uh, he wanted to see me. So I go down there and I, so I verify this whole story that I had had and that we had um, that he did attempt to kill Gotti. They got this munitions expert from the army to build a bomb, like an IED. Yeah. And, and put it underneath a car that they thought Gotti was going to be in because he visited a social club every Sunday morning with one of his boys, a guy named Tommy Bellotti. And, um, and they bring it, they, they were able to get this bomb underneath the car and this munitions expert, and this is gas pipe telling me this. He said, he said, well, Mike, I got to tell you, this is how crazy this guy was. He decided before he set the bomb off, that he was going to do it through a, through a, uh, you know, a, a radio transmission. He was, he was going to go next to the car so that he would make sure that the, the radio waves were not interfered with, you know? So he does, yeah. he blows the car up. He destroys his own car. And um, and he kills Bellotti, but he doesn't kill uh, Gotti because Gotti's not Gotti in the wasn't car. there. Yeah. So they Gotti realizes at that point that he that who did this, who set this up, and he knew gas pipe was involved. Yeah. So he now sets up a team of guys to go kill gas pipe, and they follow him to guess to his neighborhood, which is out in the Georgetown section of, of Brooklyn, kind of Canarsie ish in that area, and he's at a light. Um, uh, waiting in his car with a light and these guys pull up and they open fire on him and gas pipe is able to duck down. He crawl, he gets hit, but he's not dead. He crawls out of the car and he goes, he, he, he makes his way into the basement of a Chinese restaurant in the neighborhood there. And he sits in the Chinese restaurant, basically bleeding until somebody, till he gets some help and, uh, and then gets help. But now he is on a, He's on a vendetta. He has to find out who those guys were in the car. And he starts this, this kind of rapid, no, that's, I shouldn't say rapid. I think it was a slow um, kind of investigation into who was in that car. And who does he use? He uses the mafia cops, Epolito and Caracapa, to, um, to find out what they can about uh, who the killers were, and, or who the shooters were, I should say. And then that sets off um, that sets off a series of homicides that uh, that the mafia cops were involved in. Eddie Lino, the guy that you mentioned, um, they he's one of the the four guys in the car that was shooting a gas pipe, and he's the cousin of another 
mobster named uh, Frankie Lino. So they, they, um, they find him on the Belt Parkway, which is a highway in Brooklyn. He gets off and they pull him over in a radio car that uh, looks like a, in an unmarked car, <laughs> looks, like a ra- looks like a police car. One of those um, Crown Victorias that they used to use. And, um, and they stop him and you obviously read the book so you know the story. What, what he says immediately is they, uh, they asked for, the, for his cousin, that's the Roos. And he says, oh, fellas, you got the wrong guy. You're the wrong guy. That's my cousin. And then one of them says, what's that on the floor? And he, um, he then leans over. And one of the cops, it's Cara Kappa, who shoots him in the head and kills him. So um, that's, that's how one of them is killed. Now, the one that really breaks the case open is the Frankie Heidel mm-hmm. murder. They find out that a guy named Frankie Heidel through and through sources is one of the guys in the um, in the car, and they realize that he's a. They know that he's a weak. He's a weak link. He and his brother um, Jimmy were, you know, were kind of hanger-ons, guys that um, you know that that like to be part of the mob but actually weren't. And they um, they go to they meaning the mafia cops. Once they get the name, they go to his mother's house in Staten Island. And ask for um, and ask for him. They um, they actually do something before. Excuse me, I missed this. They stop his brother Jimmy, and um, I'm sorry. They stop his brother Frankie. It's Jimmy who was killed by the cops. It's Frankie. They stop Frankie. They um, they he says again, it's not me. You're looking for my brother. I'm not. It's not my brother. I'm not Jimmy. I'm I'm Frankie. So uh, they then go to the house and um, and he goes to his house. I'm sorry. And he tells his mother what happened. And the mother goes out, believe it or not. Yeah, um, goes out and goes finds out him. into the street. What are you doing to my and, son? <laughs> and finds these guys in a car <laughs> and confronts them. And they say, oh, it's police business. Get away, ma'am, you know, et cetera. But she gets a good look at both of them. Yeah. And um, and when Frankie comes home, he tells her about getting stopped. I'm sorry. Later on, they um, they are waiting for Jimmy to come home, and obviously Jimmy is never going to come home. What happens is, they get a tip from somebody that he's in Brooklyn, and they drive over to the Bensonhurst section of Brooklyn, and um, Jimmy is hiding out because he's got a sense that you know someone's looking for him. Word is on the street that gas pipe has got feelers out looking for people who shot him, and um, he sees the cops. And the cops call him over to the car, the two detectives, and he's relieved that they're detectives yeah. because he thought, oh, man, I'm dead. You know, I thought that he thought they were wise guys. Turns out they actually Turns out they are. Yeah. <laughs> and they, uh, they get him in the car and they tell him we're going to the precinct. And he's he lets his guard down. He says, OK, I'm happy about that. And um, instead, they drive him to a um, the parking lot of a big Toys R Us. Uh, store that's that was in the Flatbush section of Brooklyn, and in that parking lot, they tra- they t- turn him over to Gas Pipe and his thugs. Mm-hmm. Um, now, what happens is we find this out later on, and then we ultimately find the house where Gas Pipe takes him. He had a place set up. It was a it was owned by a um, one of the Lucchese guys, and they bring Jimmy down to the basement. And they basically torture him for information. And he gives up all of the names. Lino was one of the names he gave up. So Lino happens after they kill uh, Jimmy. He gives up um, a guy named Nicky Guido, who uh, I'll tell you about in a second. And he gives up a fourth name. Um, uh, can't I can't remember the name now. Um, but it doesn't make a difference. He... He, he gets killed, but not in a way that, um, I think his name was the Lappy. That's what it was. And he gets killed. He gets, um, he, he escapes and, and goes to, um, to California because he knows that, that things are going, you know, going down. So anyway, um, after Jimmy is, um, is killed, they, uh, I say to gas pipe, when I spoke to him many years later, I said, what'd you do with Jimmy's body? Because I'd like to give, 
the information to his mother to kind of close the circle and bring some closure. Yeah. And he tells me, he told me where he dumped the body. There was a, a big housing development being built in that Georgetown section of Brooklyn. And it was a construction site. And they knew, they meaning the wise guys, knew the, the <laughs> one of the people who, was, who operated a bulldozer on the site. So they were able to go in the middle of the night. They got the bulldozer. They bulldozed some earth. They dumped the body in, bulldozed it over, or put the uh, the dirt over it. And then they later on, it got built. The, the whole housing development was built. And it was basically concrete and houses. And that's where Jimmy Heidel's body is. Yeah. So um, that led to Lino. And then to me, the worst one. The one that ultimately breaks the case open. The kid, yeah. Is the kid, Nikki Guido. Yeah. And, um, and you want me to tell you to tell you the Nikki Guido story? Cause yeah, it's, yeah. Well, I was going to say before that. Yeah, go ahead. There's an, interesting, uh, there's an interesting parallel between, I think, what Ron Paul coined the term blowback. And it's like when we fly a drone over wherever, Syria, and we try to blow up you know they're all just tracking metadata so they're just firing at points on like a digital map and they blow up who, who they think is a terrorist maybe it is a terrorist but then it also takes out a cafe with a five guys four sons and a couple wives right now all of a sudden you take these guys who actually were just humans just they weren't terrorists they're just dealt a bad hand and grew up in a war zone they now become terrorists or their family members do because they're like that you know american drone just you know vaporized my family it yeah. calls it blowback and it creates more terrorists and then the terrorists attack us and we go what the hell so we go back over there and bomb them but you kind of see it with this right it's a, a the bomb goes off but doesn't kill um uh Gotti. Gotti sends out his hit team hit team doesn't kill him so he finds his guys and it just turns into this thing and it's like yeah it's what can i you even ever trace back the first thing and it's like i feel like it goes back to like 1800 like gangs of new york shit and it's just well, still it, going back and forth it could very well and that's why i talk about the domino effect it went yeah. from you know the the castellano to the attempt on Gotti to the attempt on gas pipe and then to all of these murders that are attached to the to the gas pipe shooting and um and they're all traced back you can trace them all back to you know to the first one which was the castellano shooting and yeah. um it's a point that that um that's very, I think it's a very important point because it does show the uh, the continuation. It's not, these were not just isolated events that were happening. They were all tied together and they're tied and they, they run all the way back to, you know, Castellano getting killed at Spark Steakhouse that night in, uh, you know, in, in December on, on the street in Manhattan. Yeah. So, um, the, yeah, let's the, do the, the Nikki Guido story. Yeah, the, the tragedy, the, I mean, they're, not that, other murders aren't tragedies. And, and the, uh, the name that I was looking for before was Boriello. Bobby Boriello yeah. was another guy in the car. So um, uh, Nicky Guido, they get the name from, from uh, Jimmy Heidel. And they don't know where he lives. They meaning gas pipe and his people. So he tries several methods before he finally goes to the cops. And he says to the, he says to his in between, there's a middleman, and that's this guy Bert Kaplan. Gaspipe never really deals with the cops directly. He's got this middleman, and it's Kaplan. And uh, and Kaplan is the guy who set them up together. Um, Kaplan knew that Gaspipe um, would could employ them, and once they they meaning the cops were no longer working for the Gambinos, Kaplan saw, Kaplan saw an opportunity for himself and also for Gaspipe to use these guys. So they, um, he, he meaning gas pipe asks Kaplan um, to find out what he can about Nicky Guido and where he lived. So he gives the job to, uh, to Cara Kappa. Now Cara Kappa was um, basically, a he was a detective in the major case squad, but the organized crime section of the major case squad of the NYPD. So he had access to all kinds of information about mob guys. He had access to the, the, obviously to the NYPD computer. So what he does is he signs into the computer, the NYPD computer. Remember, he's a working detective at this point. Yeah. 
and he puts the name in Nicky Guido and he finds a name that, you know, they had an idea about what this guy's age was. They had an idea as to basically, um, you know, they, they had some ideas as to where he, he lived. So they find a name that is uh, Nicky Guido, same as what they're looking for, about the same age. He lived in what's called the Windsor Park Terrace, the Windsor Terrace uh, area of Brooklyn near Prospect Park. And they say, he says, meaning uh, uh, Caracappa says, this is the guy, <laughs> this is the guy. So he gives the information to, uh, to Kaplan who gives it in turn to uh, Gas Pipe. Mm -hmm. Gas Pipe sends two hit guys out on Christmas morning. And Nicky Guido is out on the street showing his uncle his brand new car. He got a brand new car at Christmas time. This red car was beautiful. And while the uncle and Nicky are in the car, a car pulls up next to them and they open fire. And Nicky jumps on his uncle so his uncle wouldn't get hit. And he gets hit and he dies. Well, it turns out that's not the Nicky Guido who was a wise guy. That's a kid who worked for the phone company who was as innocent as can be. He just happened to have the wrong name, happened to have the wrong age, and he happened to live in the wrong area because they thought that this is where the Nicky Guido would be, would be looking. And, um, I'll tell you how it, that kind of plays a big role in breaking the case open in a minute. After that happens, the real, the real Nicky Guido at some point finds out about this and he quickly turns himself in to the police because he realizes that he's a dead man if he stays out in the street. Yeah. Now, how does that help us? Two ways. One, when I get the case, my friend Tommy Dades and I, a detective, we started this investigation. He comes to me and tells me that he had information from Jimmy Heidel's mom, which she kept to herself for years. And what she kept to herself was the idea that these two guys came to her, that she confronted these two detectives on the street when they went after Frankie, her, her other son, and she got a good look at them. And years later, she finds out when she's watching um, the Sally Jesse Raphael show, which was a talk show at that point, a very popular one, that Eppolito had written this book called Mafia Cop. And in, so she goes, she recognizes him immediately. She says, wait a second, that's the guy that went after Frankie. So she goes to a bookstore and buys the book. And in the, in the middle of the book where the pictures are, she sees a picture that Eppolito put in there of him and Kara Caput together in a squad room. Yeah. Now she says, that's the second guy. So she kept it to herself for a little while, but then she went to the FBI. The FBI didn't want to have anything to do with her. She couldn't get anybody to pay attention. About a year or so after that, Frankie Heidel gets, is an informant as well. He gets killed. And Tommy Dage catches the case. He was a detective in the precinct out there and he catches that murder and he starts to investigate the Frankie Heidel murder. Gets to know Mrs. Heidel very well and they become very close. So she never, but she never told Tommy about the incident involving Caracap and Eppolito mm -hmm. until one day, years later, she says, you know, there's something that's bothered, been bothering me for a long time. I never told you. And yeah. she tells him the story about the Frankie about the the uh, uh, Sally Jesse Raphael about the book, etc. Yeah, yeah. Didn't she say she's like, yeah, I told the FBI and they didn't do anything, so I Correct. figured if they couldn't, you couldn't. Right. So Jimmy. Tommy comes to me. We had been doing cold cases for a while now. He comes to me and he says, "You want to do this?" And I said, "Yeah, absolutely." Now I used to be, I used to work as the head of the police department's disciplinary. I was the chief prosecutor in the police department for a while. And I, and I knew about Eppolito. I didn't know about Caracappa, but I knew that Eppolito was a guy who was always on the radar of internal affairs because mm -hmm. he family was, were all wise guys. And, um, you know, and then he writes this stupid book, Mafia Cop, in which he talks about how he was the only good guy. His family was horrible. He was great, you know, that kind of thing. So we open up the investigation and, and we kind of 
you know, hit a dead end until Tommy finds the computer printout. Epolito, I'm sorry, Caracappa's computer printout of him searching for Nikki, uh, Nikki Guido. And it's buried among boxes. We had like 10 or 12 boxes of, of documents that we picked up from the feds who had these guys way back when, 10 years before us. And he comes down to me in my office and he says, Mike, we got him. Look at this. Epil uh, Caracappa searched Look at the name he comes up with and look at where it happened. Look at where he lived. And we now had the ink, you know, we had the, the beginnings of this investigation. We knew that we were on the right track. So now we, so we had Mrs. Heidel. We now had this piece of information, but you know, Tom, what happens in these cases is because the witnesses generally, and when I say witnesses, I don't mean eyewitnesses, people you call to give you little bits and pieces. Um, and these kinds of cases are not the most uh, reliable. So you can't go with just two little pieces of information. You got to keep building. And it came to a point where I said, listen, we need something else. We need some inside person to turn. And my first place, the first place I went was the gas pipe. Because I felt that here's a guy who at that point had been had turned himself in, had been charged with, I think, 13 or 14 murders, maybe even more. He was doing time. He had, he had no chance, unless he helped us, of getting any kind of sentence reduction. And um, so I figured, let's take a shot. Let's see if I can turn him, if he'll agree. Mm -hmm. He reached out to his lawyer. His lawyer said, um, let me talk to him. But I'll tell you, Mike, what I want you to do is I need to get you to grant immunity to him for the Jimmy Heidel murder. I mm -hmm. said, that's the easiest thing in the world. Are you kidding? Absolutely. It's a Brooklyn case. I can give it to you. He said, no, 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 not you. I know you'll give it to me. I want the feds to give it to me as well. I said yeah. to him, he, your client is doing 17 life sentences plus like 460 years on top of that. What is immunity going to do for him with this particular case? He goes, no, that's what I want, but I'll talk to my client and present it to him. So anyway, make a very long story short, I get a call back a week or two later. And um, he says, my client says, no, he wants immunity. Well, I'm going to fast forward a couple of years. When I go to meet gas pipe down in, in Butner, North Carolina, in a federal, he was in a federal prison hospital. He had prostate cancer. I talked to him and I say, um, I, so I got to really, we really got into this. And he says, I got to tell you something, counselor. He says, you know, I always wanted to help you. I said, well, why didn't you? He said, my lawyer on his own told you that I didn't want to help you. I always wanted to. That's why I asked you to come down now and talk to me because I wanted to help you and I would I would have given up those guys. Now, how was I to know that? Because the lawyer was my only connection to him yeah. and he was telling me he wasn't going to help. So we hit a dead end, Tom. We really hit a dead end. And um, I didn't know that the feds who originally had no interest in this case at all and told us that we were crazy to go do this because they will never, never break this case open. Now that we were starting to make some progress, I hear that they now began an investigation. Well, because they didn't want them to, right? It had something to do with Gotti, correct? Yes. What happened was gas pipe at some point after Gotti was convicted, sent the feds a letter saying that Sammy the Bull Gravano, when he testified, was basically full of shit. <laughs> Yeah. Excuse my French. I guess you want, this is a podcast. You, yeah, can, you can say, say whatever, you can say whatever the fuck you want. Yeah, no, they were like, he's basically saying that guy's a liar. And Correct. if it turns out to be a liar, the whole thing's fucked. It gets thrown out on a technicality. Correct. That's right. So they had no interest in giving gas pipe any kind of play at all. They would not allow him to, to touch, you know, they would not, they didn't want us anywhere near him. So they, um, so they, they, I went to them and said, listen, here's what I have. 
I have this guy agreeing to will will through his lawyer will testify for me. If you guys just give him immunity in a case that you have no interest in, you already got him for 17 life sentences. What's the interest? They were Tom. They were so pissed at him. They said to me, we wouldn't give that guy, you know, a glass of water if it was the last thing that he could, you know, to yeah. help him survive. We wouldn't do it. Yeah, we wouldn't do it. We're not doing it. So, again, I was stuck. But then I find out that they really started to get the, the, the urge to keep going. And they had their they had an ace in the hole. And the ace in the hole was this guy, Burke Kaplan. Kaplan was the mastermind of this marriage between the two cops and the um, and the and the, uh, the the Lucchese's and gas pipe in particular. So he had all the information we needed. He had every, he if we got him to turn, he gives us the case. And then we use all of the other things that we discovered Heidel's mother and the and the and the ultimately the guy that was buried in the in the garage and and Eddie Lino all of this stuff all falls into place nicely. But um, I was told by the feds that um, Kaplan was not interested in turning. That he they tried to turn him years before. He took a big heavy sentence on a very very heavy drug trafficking charge and kept his mouth shut because he was not a rat, according to him. So I had no place to turn because I could offer Kaplan nothing. Mm -hmm. He was in a federal facility. I would have to get the feds to agree to give him a break on a sentence, even though I knew that he was elderly and he was sick. But um, I, I, had to, I had to depend on them. Now, they, what they did is on their own, not even telling me they began a grand jury investigation. And I find it out just I, in happenstance, my, the chief investigator from my office, Joe Ponzi sit, is sitting me with, with me one day and he had been involved with us at the very beginning of this case. <laughs> and he said, you know, Mike, they're in the grand jury on this. I said, what? How could they be in a grand jury? They, they haven't kept us up, up to speed. We're, we're working on this thing together. He said, they're in the grand jury and they're going after Kaplan. I said, how can they do that? They told us he wasn't interested. Well, as it turns out, what they did was they, they, they were working together with, they wouldn't tell me, but they grabbed Ponzi and they had asked him to come with them to interview Kaplan along with their investigator. They went to the jail and they got Kaplan and, um, and Kaplan basically said, I'm not a rat. I'm not giving anything to you. I can't, you can't help me. And they, they said, look, your daughter, who by the way, was a judge, a, a criminal court judge in, in Brooklyn. It's interesting that he had, he had this, this terrific daughter who was a, and I knew who she was. She used to work in legal aid. Now she was a judge. Mm -hmm. He had just had a kid. So he was a grandfather. We knew that he was, he was probably dying. And they tried every single, um, way of trying to get him to agree to testify because they promised him that if he did, you know, he would, they would be able to get him out of jail and he'd be able to see his grandchildren, his grandchild and meet his daughter again. Nothing. So I'm not a rat. I'm not a rat. I'm not a rat. Well, he gets up and as he's walking out of the room, Ponzi says to him, you think it was right that they killed that kid, Guido, Nikki Guido? So Joe tells me later on that he stopped. He literally stopped and he turned around and to make, again, a long story short, he sat down and you Ponzi you said to know him, everything. Yeah. tell me, um, tell me that you, that, that that's not the worst thing you heard in terms of this case. And he basically, that got him. It got him that, that bringing those guys to justice for that murder was what turned uh, Bert Kaplan. Yeah. Kaplan became a witness. Now the case was taken away from us. Actually, I shouldn't take, I shouldn't say that. I'll tell you how it happened. We were looking at the, the Nikki Guido uh, homicide, which is what we would have prosecuted them on. Mm -hmm. So the feds came to me one day and they said, listen, here's our proposition. 
we know you guys broke this thing open. We know how much work you guys you guys done. We know that your boss is anxious to you know to report to uh, to announce this, etc. But if we give you, if the Nikki Guido case gets tried separately from now, what could be a RICO case, a much bigger federal RICO, RICO case, there's a hole, you know, there's a hole in this thing. So let us do the, let us do the, the case, the RICO case with the Nikki Guido homicide as part of the, of one of the underlying charges. And when we make the arrest and do the announcement, your boss can do can take credit and you guys can take credit for everything. So I went, I really didn't want to do this. I wanted to still do what I wanted to do, but um, I couldn't convince them that I could try the Nikki Guido case without hurting their, their Rico case, but they wouldn't have any, they said, listen, go talk to your boss. So I did, he agreed. He said, listen, as long as we get credit, they can try it in federal court, it's okay. And that was the deal. We had a solid deal. We were going, we gave them the Nikki Guido case. We gave them all of our work. We gave them, I had even an assistant DA assigned to the case with them and they were going to try it together. We had our investigators working with their investigators. So it was a marriage that was perfect. And then one day I get a call from the same prosecutors who had been dealing with me and made the promise. And they said, um, deal's off. Somebody went to 60 Minutes and broke this thing. 60 Minutes was going to do a TV show and they hadn't arrested our Caracap and Epolito yet. So they had to now quickly find them and, and arrest them before the 60 Minutes thing hit. And they blamed us for the leak. They said, you know, it was your fault. They actually blamed our public information officer. Turns out later on, after the fact, I find out that the leak was a DEA agent who was working with the feds because the Caracap and Epolito had moved to Las Vegas and was selling drugs in, in Las Vegas. The DEA agent was the one who leaked the information to the press. And that's how the whole thing got, uh, got to 60 Minutes attention. But we took the, we took the brunt of the, the blame. They said, we did it. The whole deal was off. The announcement was made in federal court when we when they uh, arrested them and they did a press conference. And um, although we did have a chance, we were doing a, a press conference on another case that day, and my boss took the opportunity to, you know, to tell his our story in terms of how we we broke the case open that day. But it was a very bad, it left a bad taste in, in my mouth. I'll never forget how how they screwed me, you know, and. Uh, and Tom, they lied, you know, I mean, they just basically lied to me about, um, about this stuff. And they, you know, and when I see now how the FBI and how the federal authorities operate and what they've done, you know, over the last four or five years, it's not, it was not, not a surprise to me ever because of, of what happened, you know, during this case. And um, it was, uh, and, and, you know, it was a, it, <laughs> It was a very bad situation. And I looked like a jerk because I had cut the deal on behalf of my boss. You know, he, he lost it. He said to me, look, Mike, I'm not even going to the press conference. You know, let you go and you stand up, you uh, represent us, but I'm not going. I don't want to look like a, like a jerk. And, and I didn't blame him because we had a, we had a solid deal. We gave up our end of the case and, um, and it turned out to be not so, not so good for us. So, but what happened, but this is another interesting thing. What happens is they, they bring this Rico based on the fact that Epolito and Caracapa were running an organization out in Las Vegas selling drugs. Yeah. Because there was no continuing criminal enterprise. These guys were, were retired cops. They weren't involved with the... Yeah gas pipe and then for for well over 10 years yeah but they bootstrapped this 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 their contacts thing. yeah out there they had a d undercover dea informant pretend to be somebody in hollywood and that he was coming to vegas to do some scouting for a location and he wanted drugs and they hooked him up with caracapa and epolito who had the who had the ability to to get him drugs 
And that was enough in their minds to establish that these two guys were still operating together and that this continuing criminal enterprise was still continuing. I never bought it for a, a second. And I didn't think a federal judge would buy it, buy it either. But they indicted them and they went to, they went to, the case ultimately went to trial in federal court on this flimsy continuing criminal enterprise in Vegas. And of course, given the, the, the evidence, because Kaplan testified at the trial, they, there was no chance they were going to lose this case. And they didn't. They won, right? They, meaning the feds, won. But what happens is the judge, who I thought was going to, had a, would have a problem with this, the judge dismisses the, the case. He says that this continuing criminal enterprise idea is so flimsy, it's non-existent. So you don't have a RICO and the case can't be tried in federal court. So is that, is the, it's not a continuing thing. Is that because it's like, um, look, Tom Brady's going, going back to the Super Bowl. Like you wouldn't say that this is like the Patriots 10th Super Bowl, right? It's like, he's moved on. It's a, and, and as someone that doesn't know shit about law. Okay. So I'll tell you what it, what it is. These guys were operating together, working with the mob for the time that they were cops in New York, right? That ended probably about nine to 10 years before we opened up the investigation. Mm -hmm. They were not operating together any longer. So for us in, in the state court, there was no continuing criminal enterprise. It had ended when they separate, when they retired and moved out to Las Vegas, okay? That's what the problem was with the feds, why they had a, had very, had a very difficult time figuring out how they would prosecute these guys um, because of the length of time that existed between when they were operating together and now when they were, when we, they wanted to bring the indictment. So what did they do? They did enough searching and checking and, and, and investigating in Vegas. And they found a DEA agent who was doing an investigation into the fact that these two guys were selling drugs out there. Now, did it have anything to do with the original um, uh, enterprise that they had where they were killing people on behalf of the mob and providing information? No, but they said that these two guys together now working on the drug deals was continuing, was a continuing thing and connected it tenuously to what they were doing back in Brooklyn during the time of our invest, you know, during the time of the, that we were investigating, okay? That's why I say it was very tenuous. It was not a, a strong connection. And a federal judge, a guy who's been on the bench forever, dismissed the case because he said, there is no continuing criminal enterprise. Don't tell me that that drug thing, that's a new thing. That's something new. There's no connection to what they were doing in Brooklyn. So you can't bring all of these homicides, et cetera, in to say that it's a, a, RICO, a RICO case. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. And and I, so what happens is once they, once that, that, that case gets dismissed, the feds were going to uh, appeal it. Okay. And they, they told us they were going to appeal it, but they said to us, said to me, you better get ready because you're probably going to have to try this case. If we lose on appeal, then the only thing left are these individual murders. And now we're going to basically send them back to you so that you can, you can, um, you can try them. So mm -hmm. I was now back to where I wanted to be in terms of getting ready to try these cases. All I had to do was wait for the decision from the federal appeals court. There was a good chance in my mind that the appeals court was going to go along with the decision by this long time sitting judge in Brooklyn, um, but they didn't. They reversed him, reinstated the conviction and, um, and he then sentenced these guys to life. So I never got the chance, even though I was hoping against hope that that the, the appeals court would um, would would keep the con it's it's a very odd thing to be. I, I'm a prosecutor and I wanted the case to be dismissed or stay dismissed, but I did for a reason because I wanted to it to come to Brooklyn and give me the opportunity to try him for uh, for the murder, particularly of Jimmy Heidel. I had more than enough, 
And now with Kaplan as a witness, it was a, you know, it was a, an easy case to try. Um, but they, they appealed the, the federal appeals court's decision, uh, reinstating their conviction, they lost. And um, it never got to the Supreme Court because they, would, they didn't have an issue that the Supreme Court would take. And that was it. They got sentenced to life in, in prison, both of them, plus life plus many years. Yeah. One guy went to California. I think it was Epolito. Another guy went to Texas, Caracapa. Don't hold me to that. It might have been vice versa. And um, Caracapa died uh, several years ago. And then more recently, Epolito died. But his daughter, Epolito's daughter, maintained the fact that he was an innocent man, an innocent man, totally innocent man. He was not, Tom, believe me. <laughs> you know, he, he's the kind of guy he was. He bragged in Mafia Cop, his, his own book. His own, yeah. That when, when he was a street cop, when he was a uniform cop, and Most he would effective. arrest somebody for yeah. like domestic violence or he would, he made it a point to go back to the home of the victim, the woman, and oftentimes sweet talked his way in and had sex with her. Now that is, that's something that he said himself in his, in his own book. And he was, you know, he, it was sort of like a, to him, like a red badge of courage, I think, you know, it was yeah. kind of, so I knew what I was dealing with and, and Epoli and uh, Cara Kappa, he was accepted in the police department during the uh, Vietnam war. When a lot of guys were not applying for the, for the PD because they weren't around, you know, they yeah, were drafted. fighting. They were in the army and the Marines and the Navy. So they were taking, they lowered their standards and he had a burglary conviction, Caracapa in his, in his background. And uh, <coughs> so these were not two, uh, you know, two guys who were as pure as the driven snow and, um, and they were greedy. And, uh, and, you know, I think that um, I, I remember when our guys along with the FBI and the DEA arrested them, they told me the story, my guys told me the story that these two guys, the Epolito and Caracapa was sitting in a restaurant, an Italian restaurant in Vegas. I think at lunchtime when all of these guys came in, they were the most shocked guys in the world. Like, what are you doing here? Who, what are you saying? Who are you arresting me? Well, for what, you know, it was, it was so many years later that they thought that they had, um, they had gotten away with it, but, um, but they yeah. didn't. You know? Well, it's like what you said. You're like, <clears throat> in your book you were like uh you're like i'm not trying to sound like the kind of the movie trope of you know, this time it's personal but yeah. you're like but really you're like when it's when it's me and all these guys and you're on the force and you know it's like you're working shitty hours for like not glorious pay and you have guys that are so honorable they turn down a free cup of coffee and they, they're bringing home 180 bucks a week. And then you have uh, Polito and Caracapa going in and what, getting 12,000 or 10,000 a month or 5,000 a month. And then they get, they get a raise and it's, yeah. and they're turning these guys over with just like, without even, I mean, to the point where you were like, I imagine that they're just laughing about it because they're making so much money exactly. behind this badge that it's yep. like, yeah, at a certain point it's personal. <laughs> like, well, you know, it became it. My boss, when he talked about it, it and he said this right, it was one of the most uh, heinous uh, and worst corruption cases in the history of the NYPD. And it was. Yeah. I mean, think about these guys were on the mob payroll. They were retained like a lawyer would be retained, you know? Yeah, they different. would get their money, and all they had to do, and I, and I say that facetiously, was to just give information as to who was informing on gas pipe and other mobsters. And, and they would, um, they got paid for that. And then if they did the killings, like they got paid extra for the Lino killing, they yeah. got paid extra for the, for the, um, for the uh, Jimmy Heidel killing, you know, and um, it was, uh, it was a horrible, horrible situation. And, uh, and, and it was, and personally, Tom, I got to tell you, it may, it was much more horrible in, in, uh, when I thought about it later on, um, because if you can't trust the guy who walks in with the badge in his hand, yeah, then it's all over. You know, I, I did a, I, I did another, I did a case once. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. I did a, a murder case 
um, a, 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 a family of uh, Asian uh, immigrants owned a liquor store in Brooklyn. And, um, and in the 80s, 90s, even into the early 2000s, the liquor stores in Brooklyn were, you walk in, you couldn't walk around the store and pick out, you had to operate, these guys operated behind plexiglass because uh -huh. it was so difficult, you know, it was so dangerous. So um, this guy walks into the liquor store and um, he says to the owner, shows a shield, he's mm -hmm. a cop. He says, I need to use your bathroom. Can I use your bathroom? Now he knew to he knew that the bathroom was behind the, the on the other side of the uh, the plexiglass, and of course, what do they say? Yeah, of course, come on in, come on in. He gets behind the plexiglass, pulls a gun, and announces a stick up. Then he tells him to let his other guy, his partner, in. He gets in, and um, after after they rob the store, the cop says to his buddy, "The see my face." They saw they they saw me, you know. They saw me. They got to go. And um, and they kill us. They kill the the owner of the store, shoot and attempt to kill his worker, but he doesn't he doesn't die. He gets paralyzed. So, um, but the reason that they that they were he was in a position to do this, this cop was because of that shield. He showed the shield and said, you know, I I got to come in. And this poor guy, you know, let him in. Um, I may have written this in Crooked Brooklyn, but yeah. I, I do. I did. Okay. So, you know, that I go back years later and to try the case and I want to see the store and I, I walk in and with investigators and we show our shields to the, to the, now his family is running the store and, and they all like cringe, you know, yeah, they really. say, get out, get out, get out. And then we realize what we had done, the same thing that well, you know, the bad guy did. So yeah, there's some... that's, that's, it, it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a bad, a, a terrible, terrible, uh, this service, it's, um, it's really a, um, it's what, really um, bad. it's what it's Elon Musk described on his first time going on Joe Rogan is he talked about the inherent sub and this is a, a, a bit of an odd analogy, but I think it fits. And it's the inherent subsidy of corporations onto, uh, onto the climate. And it's that, that, you know, cause the, the charge brought against, or not charge, but I guess public complaint a lot brought against uh, Elon Musk is, oh, Tesla gets all these federal stipends and shit. And he says, well, he says all corporations in a sense get a stipend because if you're logging and you're just shredding it, and, and I'm not going on, I'm not going on some Greenpeace rant. Like I get it. We got to yeah, get it. But he's like for every company that they dump their sludge into a river or, you know, they're burning all this shit into the atmosphere or they're acidifying the oceans. There's an inherent subsidy from the population at large that their these companies' profits are paid for by your decreasing air quality, your less health, you know, you can't get a fish without it having mercury poisoning or something. And so there's an inherent subsidy that you're already paying to these companies mm -hmm. because we're all on this one in this biosphere together, right? We're all in the same pool and someone's pissing in it. And it's like, mm -hmm. sure, yes, you don't have yes. to go pay to use the bathroom at Starbucks, but we're all paying now. You can say that they're, what they did is there was an inherent subsidy on everyone with the badge. So for everyone that's gone to work every day, six days a week, and they did their 40 years on the squad and they, you know, and they were stand up guys multiply that by every precinct and every state and every whatever you build up this reputation, almost like a credit score. And then Kara Kappa and Epolito come in and by sh using that badge to just do whatever they want, they have in a sense, you guys have all subsidized it as you know, going it. in with your badges and they're like, no, no, no. And you're like, shit, like, yep odd analogy but i had to draw yeah no you're you're exactly right you know it took us it took us a good you know uh half an hour to an hour to talk to these people to tell them once they realized that this was the family of this this the store owner who was actually who was killed yeah once they realized what we were doing and why we were there that we were trying to bring their father's killer to justice then they kind of relented and let us get in and look around and yeah it's very important when you're a when you're a trial lawyer to 
to go to the scene of the crime at some point so that you can you can get what's in you can get in your head the geography because that becomes a very it, it could become a very important piece of of of, of uh, part of the questioning um, both in terms of the defense as well as the prosecution, because if the defense tries to use something that they say is part of this geography uh, and it's not correct, you know, and you have been there and say, well, no, it, it, it's not that color, it's this color, because I was there and saw it, then, then that's a very important thing. And that's why, you know, that's why we went. And, um, and it, was, uh, it was so eye-opening to me about how, how much uh, this cop's betrayal of these people uh, had uh, had the effect it had on um, on them was was just incredible and you know what he lived down the block this the cop his name was Cabeza Robert Cabeza he lived down the block from the liquor store he probably you know he was was seen walking around that neighborhood all the time it's it was his own neighborhood and um, so you know so they the Caracap and Epolito betrayal, and that's what I call it, mm -hmm. um, to to not only the citizens, but to his fellow cops and to everybody, every law enforcement person in the entire country was uh, was enormous. The betrayal was was beyond belief. And um, and, you know, <laughs> the thing is that when when I spoke to Gas Pipe, he told me that he had brought all of this to the attention of the uh, the FBI before years before it came to me years and um, and and all they were concerned about was well you know this guy's not so great he'll uh, you know if we give him any kind of credit at all then we'll lose the we may lose the case against Gotti which was a ridiculous thought for them to have in my opinion so they let two murderers two murderers with a badge kind of escape if it hadn't been for you know for Tommy and I to start this thing they would have escaped all of the scrutiny that they had they would have escaped all any kind of punishment never paid for their for the for the murders that they committed and never paid for that betrayal so um you know it was a uh, it, it was very satisfying um for me even though the conviction was had in another courthouse and I wasn't part of it it was a uh, it was a good day when I heard that they were convicted. Um, but uh, so, you know, it, it um, I, I, I got to tell you one of the, one little kind of anecdote. You probably read it if you got the uh, the later edition of the book. We have a an epilogue of me going to Butner to talk to to Gas Pipe, and um, and when we um, you know I said to him, he said I said to him, did you read the book? He said, uh, yeah, I read the book. I said, so? He goes, you're about 98% accurate on everything. I, I took that as a, uh, as, a, as a great, you know, a, a hey. good thing. Because, yeah. hey, you know, I wasn't there. I'm just depending on other people telling me. That's pretty story. solid. That's yeah, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. And um, when he told me that he wanted to be a part of this and that his lawyer was, uh, was the guy who was the, the obstructionist, I, I was so upset. And the lawyer by that point, by the time that I had interviewed Gas Pipe years later, his lawyer had passed away. So I, that's, I couldn't even call him on the phone and yell at him. You know? Dude, that's where it gets that's where it gets hairy. Cause I mean, back to the departed, right? It's they find out and it's like Frank, he's an FBI informant. And it's just like, oh shit. And at the very end when Matt Damon's like, Did you give me up? And he's like, I didn't give anybody up that wasn't going down anyway. And you just realize like shit like cops died undercover cops died yep. because it just goes so much higher up yeah you kind of yeah. get that with the lawyer saying like you got to do this and you know the feds being like we don't want to do this because it will fuck up sammy the bull's testimony and it just goes higher and higher up and it gets like it just i mean it's got me thinking like and this is all wild speculation but i mean like you know it's again this is wild speculation but it's you know like the idea that like um we intercepted uh, the Japanese Navy's uh, movements on Pearl Harbor, but we were realizing that 
just through FDR's Lend-Lease program to the UK. That wasn't enough to keep Hitler and the Axis powers at bay. And eventually it was going to come to our shore. So the whole conspiracy goes. And as a conspiracy guy, this isn't even one of my favorite ones. The idea that we let Pearl Harbor happen, that's why we had the ships next to each other, because it was like, now we can go get them. But it's, I mean, what if that's the case? What if you're an NSA um, what if you're intercepting this shit and you're uh, like, we got this thing and it's like, yeah. Hey, you it know, be, it's bigger machines at work. And it's like, don't even get in here. It would be awful Tom. If that it, was, if that yeah. it would be awful, it would be, but, awful. It, but I mean, I just, I look at if we can see it and we know for a fact it happened in your experiences. I mean, you kind of got to, you, is it a fractal? Does it repeat on bigger and bigger levels? I mean, again, wild speculation, but one thing I've always thought is like, Man, if you got, let's say you're not in the mob, but let's say you're in like the tech mob, let's say you're Microsoft and you've got your Apple on Kara Kappa in the NSA and maybe yeah. you're going, hey, uh, I want you guys to go pull over Tim Cook of Apple. No one else can get into Apple security, but when the NSA comes knocking with a national security warrant, he goes, oh, shit, and he comes in and he goes, oh, no, no, we're not doing anything with the Chinese. We're just working on this new touchscreen. How do you not know that these NSA guys are just, you know, okay, new touchscreen, you're using this, you're using that, slip that to Microsoft. They pay you $10 because they're going to get $10 billion in profit. I mean, it's their NSA corporate espionage. And again, these are giant leaps from, like, Brooklyn dirty cops, but... If yes. it happened there, why giant can't... leaps? Yeah, but not yeah, impossible. Not you know? impossible. Not and for the record, impossible. I'm not speaking for Mike. <laughs> These are my no, wild yeah. conspiracies. Yeah. Um, so let me tell you some of the good news with this. We, yeah. you know, I, I don't know if you I, I certainly don't talk about this in the book, but since the book came out, you know, I sold this to um to various Hollywood entities four times the story. Um and Warner Brothers was the first, the first. Uh, studio that bought it and I, I'll never forget the pitch that I did with them and they were so excited and they you know it even had an ending of me standing up in, in front of the federal uh, you know the press conference with the at federal court and telling him who really did the case you know that was the way they were going to end this thing you know um, so uh, so they then after the the option ran out they didn't renew it they said they didn't have the money we sold it to um, to Mark Cuban's uh, yeah, Mark yeah. Cuban's company. Yeah, twenty nine twenty nine Productions. That didn't work out. Then we sold it again. Actually, three times. Sold it again. But now I got to tell you, Tom, I get a call out of the blue in the middle of a pandemic from the book agent who was who sold the book to. Um, we did this with. Um, let's see, who was it? It was Harper Collins who who published uh, Friends of the Family. So our book agent calls me and says, Mike, <laughs> you're not going to believe this, but I got a check for you. I said, a check for what? He said, um, there's a big Hollywood guy that's optioning the, uh, wants to option a book. He's got a plan for a uh, TV series. He's since signed Terry Winter, who is the, the guy who was the creator of Boardwalk Empire, was uh -huh. one of the, the head writers of The Sopranos, um, the guy who wrote The Wolf of, uh, Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, he's part of the team now. So we're um, we're keeping oh, our shit. fingers crossed that uh, that maybe one of these days I'll be calling you when the and to talk about the premiere and when the uh, absolutely when the premiere is going to happen. So that uh, would be the best thing ever. If yeah, you have to. I, I I called dibs on being your plus one at the red carpet premiere. Yeah. I wanna, I wanna <laughs> Thank be, you. I want to be there. That's I'll be. I want. That's badass, man. Because that yeah. could, I mean, that could legitimately be. I mean, that's that's as sexy of a story as Departed. I mean, oh, it's without a, a doubt, yeah. It's, it's, the it's idea, yeah. Real. The idea is to um, Terry. Terry was one of the. Terry actually wrote one of the scripts during the all of these various buyers. Um, the first, the first person who wrote the script was a guy named Keir Pearson. He wrote. He won the Academy Award for um, Hotel um Rwanda there mm -hmm. was a uh, and it just never went anywhere then Terry wrote it and Terry uh Terry did a very very good job wrote it very much um faithful it was very faithful to the book and Hollywood being Hollywood they said to him well you know you gotta 
There's not enough for this. There's not enough for that. So we had to rewrite it where we had my friend Tommy up in a helicopter with Epolito, you know, going surrounding. There was a threat against the Statue of Liberty. Oh, I mean, the fuck that. So ridiculous. That. So I'm so happy that he's back because he wrote the best script of all of the ones that were written. He wrote the uh, he wrote the best one. And now he's back. And um and we're keeping our fingers crossed that we get a studio who will um, who buy it. And uh, they're looking to do like a 10 part series, you know, one yeah. of those kinds of things, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so we'll see, you know, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll certainly keep you posted. So that way, you know, we can talk about it one, at one day. That would Fuck be great. Yeah. So Fuck yeah. And if you get, if you get like DiCaprio to star in it, I demand DiCaprio come on. <laughs> Even if for five minutes, I want him to come on. Yeah. I'll get um. you. Uh, I'll talk, <laughs> I'll talk him into it. So Good. we'll see. I, I did want to say, yeah, before we uh, wrap up, there was yeah. two lines that were not, one was a line, one was a, t- the one line that made me laugh pretty hard was they got, uh, as, uh, they got along about as well as a cat and a Chinese chef. Yeah. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> I'm, I'm keeping that one. And um, the other one was just the guy that just always had these little businesses and you just always trying to scrap together a buck. And how one of them is just, it took such a wild turn where it was like he was trying to sell like psoriasis skincare lotion to people in Africa, but his chemist left out an ingredient. So it turned like to sludge. And then to recoup his cost, the chemist was just, it went very quickly from zero to 100. He's like, well, I know we were trying to make that lotion, but I can cook you meth. And he was like, all right. <laughs> it's, just, it's just like, holy shit. It just, yeah, 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 yeah. I had, I had to touch on that. Cause that I actually laughed out loud. It was like, that went from zero to a hundred, very <laughs> turned to sludge. I can make you crystal meth. And it's like, so we got into that. So Jesus, but yeah, that, that, that was, um, I think that was in Vegas, right? The, um, yeah, was, yeah. Yeah. When they were in Vegas. Yeah. So, so they, you know, they, they made a, um, as it turns out because of the, their, their, their drug operation in Vegas, if you want to even call it that, it wasn't, you know, it's not like it was a cartel or anything, Yeah. but those, those little deals together was really enough for the federal court to say, yeah, there was a, a continuing enterprise. And that's what allowed the Rico case to stand up. So, and they got uh, life in prison, you know, so it was, um, it, it, and it was not enough. They were greedy from the day they got together, Tom. And that greed basically led them That's into prison and and now into the grave you know so yeah. it's um right it's and, and and believe me it couldn't have happened to two nicer guys believe me, two more <laughs> worthy guys they yeah. were they were real scumbags they really were you know so but uh, yeah it's i mean it's like the you know it's like the millionaire celebrity that gets caught shoplifting and it's like they don't need the money they don't need the thing it's just the, no, it's the greed no. it's the rush of getting away with it and that's that's i mean it's Right. It's I mean, it's almost cheesy how like stereotypical of like, it's the same trope you see in like, you know, ancient writing. And it's like, the, yeah. you know, they just kept they had to keep pushing it, had to keep pushing it. And eventually they got fucked. Last thing. Yes. And again, wild speculation. Do you think there are other police in anywhere in America? We'll keep it to America past or present that are a care cap on Epolito. Do you think that they are still out? The guys maybe, I mean, are there, I mean, shootings, right? Go, you know, the, the no knock warrants that, you know, how many of those, maybe this is just my sexy, shitty Hollywood mind. How many I, of I those are hits? I think if there were, and there's certainly anything, as I I'll say this, anything is possible. Okay. That's the way I'll answer it. But I don't believe that it's the kind of the, the, that the that type of problem manifests itself in you know a police shooting of somebody you know with a no knock warrant or something like that. That's that's not the kind of thing that that these guys were into. These guys were into major corruption in the sense that they were being paid, as you you joked about before, they were on retainer with the mob for information, and they did the hits as a sidelight. So. They were planned hits. The Eddie Lino thing was totally planned. They knew where he he where he was going. They knew what road he was taking. They knew you know exactly what would happen when they pulled him over. You can't compare that to someone who break does a, a no knock warrant, breaks in, and, and winds up shooting somebody. I, I don't believe it's it's analogous. Um, 
is it possible that that he he does it that way if he's a, a a corrupt cop and that's how he winds up killing a a mark maybe i mean i wouldn't be surprised but it's not it's not something that uh, that i think is is likely sure. i think that it's yeah. it's if they're going to do this if there are guys doing this it's more planned certainly bigger money um mm. and a and a much more insidious way of 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 operating as opposed to, you know, the kind of situation uh, where it's, as you put it, knock on the door, you know, bust in and, and somebody gets shot. That That's not the way it would work. It's, yeah. it's a different kind of thing. But um, I, I look, the mob is still in, in play. Many mobs are still in play in addition to the Italians, to the mafia. There are, you know, there are all kinds of, 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 mobs out there from from Eastern European to Asian to, you know, Jamaican to to all kinds of things, drug cartels, etc. So are there is there a temptation out there for a cop who's making, you know, forty thousand dollars a year, fifty thousand dollars a year to take money because he's got maybe a, a kid at home who is sick and needs help? Of course, the temptation's there. Um, it's uh, it's not something that's beyond the realm of possibility. So um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, you know that look at look at the guy I talked about. That guy Cabeza. Mm -hmm. You know what he you know why he did the he did these these rob he didn't do just this robbery. I think in Crooked Brooklyn I talk about when we did the when the cops did the perp walk with him after we arrested him on the murder. Their switchboard blew up in the police department. Why he had held up a restaurant in Manhattan a year before in which he robbed every pa every patron in the restaurant of their wallets, their keys, their, their, uh, their, their um, watches, et cetera. And he was never caught. And when he was seen on TV in the perp walk, all of the patrons yeah. in the restaurant said, that's the guy, that's the guy. Yeah. He wound up getting on top of my 25 to life. He wound up getting, a series of uh, penalties of, of, of jail sentences for all of the, for each of the per people that he robbed in that, in that case, you know, that restaurant in Manhattan. Now, what was his reason? The guy liked fast cars. He liked uh, to live a high life. You know, that was his thing. So he needed somehow to supplement his income and that's how he did it. So, you know. Um, you feel like those guys supplementing their income would have just gone into the mob from the first place yeah it's like dude yeah, just, yeah. Just, just go do it full time not only yeah, that yeah. these guys have the guts and to go and do this shit you know when their lives are on the line why not put that i mean i know i sound just like a sheltered white kid but like why not put that work ethic into going to become a pharmacist <laughs> yeah I, you're right you're right <laughs> and how stupid is this guy cabeza did to rob a store down the block from where he lives you know i mean um, and, and, Retarded. and that left, and you know, it's bad enough to do a robbery. That would have been a lot of a lot of time for him. Yeah. He has to kill the owner of the restaurant, um, the, uh, the liquor store that made it, you know, that compounded the, uh, the, the, the number of years that he was, that he wound up getting and, yeah. um, sad and he, and he, you know, he broke up that family and, uh, and all the poor guy wanted to all the poor guy behind the counter was doing was helping out a cop to use the bathroom. That's what I mean. It's like that you all subsidize that. Yeah. Right. Every time there's a shooting of an unarmed black man, it's like everyone subsidizes that. So now yeah. when Bob Smith shows up at my door and he's like, Hey, can we talk? My first instinct is like, you can come back with a warrant, but like get the fuck out of here. And it's mm. like, that might be the most stand up officer ever. Right. And it's exactly, exactly. We all, we all suffer because of the bad guys. That's what happens. We all, you know, and, and believe it or not, all of the good cops, 99.9% .9 suffer as a result of that as well. Cause they all get painted with the same brush, yeah. which is unfair. Or at least if they don't get painted with the same brush, they get painted with a, a piece of that, of that brush. And that's yeah. what, um, that's what is, is so horrible. And so, so bad. And, you know, I got to tell you with the Cabeza case, the guys that helped that did the investigation with me were not internal affairs. They were the cops from the precinct, the detectives from the precinct that this guy lived in and did the robbery in. They were so angry and so intent on 
making sure that we got a the right guy and when we got him we got him good that um it was it was eye-opening they were they were terrific in terms of of the cooperation that we had but it was cops from his precinct and not internal affairs who did that case so you know um dirty fuckers yeah 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 they knew it so when's your uh When's your next book coming out? I know. You, well, I, know I just working on I, it. Since we last spoke, I turned it in. Um, the uh, the publisher tells me end of the summer, maybe beginning of the fall, uh, which is good because beginning of the fall is kind of like a, a buying time for books, and it's getting close to you know to Christmas time and stuff. So that's um, and it will be an audio book. The big the big contract, the big part of that contract was. The audio book part. So you gotta um, do audio. You gotta do yeah, audio. Yeah, it's called Homicide is My Business. Luigi the Zip, a hitman's quest for honor. That's the name of the book. So uh, <laughs> but that was his line when he yeah. testified in front of Congress. He said, uh, Congressman, oh, no, not Congress, Senator, homicide is my business. And um, so we decided to to use that as uh, as the title. And uh, I, I unless the publishers change it. I don't think they will. I, I think it's a very catchy title. And um, we have pretty good, um, we have a pretty good, some pretty good suggestions for cover, for a cover uh, for it, you know, so. Uh, you know, I just, I just thought of something when we were, I don't know, I've kept, I've kept you 30 minutes longer than I said it would, but, right. you know, I was just thinking how I was saying, you know, granted, it's all fantastic and it's, it's extrapolating to astronomical theoretical situations of you know could this thing happen on bigger and bigger scales and it's like we don't know but anything's possible i was just thinking i i read a book last month actually where i listened to it several times it's about a uh, general smudley smedley darlington butler who retired in 1933 he went from an enlisted man to a major general um he helped uh he helped uh as a Republican, he helped go on the campaign trail with FDR and campaigned for him to get in. So most decorated, I believe the most decorated armed services member of, uh, in American history, World War okay. One, the Korea, the, uh, the Caribbean interventions, Chinese interventions. Um, when he got out, he said that it was it was kind of like a military industrial complex speech that Eisenhower gave on his last day in office. He kind of gave right. that same speech almost 30 years before in 1933. And he said, war is a racket. And I won't read it right now, but basically goes in and says, like, you know, having gone from the bottom to the, like the tippy top, he was like, I can now say that he was like, unfortunately, he's like, unless we're defending our shores or the Bill of Rights or sorry, the sh our shores, our borders or the Bill of Rights. It's a racket. And he's like going to South America and we got to take, we got to topple these nations. He's like, we're doing it for like, um, you know, whatever the dull banana. He's like, when I go into the middle East and we got to take out this shy, he's like, I'm doing this for standard oil. And he's yeah, like, yeah. I start to learn. He's like, I got to go protect America, wall street interests in China. So they're not molested by the Chinese army. And he goes, I'm starting to realize that, you know, I have a flag and armed forces with matching uniforms, but he's like, I'm just a henchman. And uh, I think his, his, his quote at the end was, I could have given Al Capone some pointers. He operated on three in three counties. I operated on three continents. Right. But I was just thinking like, it's not the same because Kerikap and Epelito were conscious of it and they knew what they were doing. Whereas he kind of realized this in hindsight as an old man with all of his wisdom. But I mean, it goes all the way up to the level of like war and intervention was mm -hmm. like it's, yeah. they were doing it as a front for these to the point where where um, Prescott Bush, the grandfather of George Bush, as well as J.P. Morgan and a couple other guys actually tried to bribe Smedley Butler to use a bunch of veterans to overthrow the White House and remove FDR. And it's called the business plot with a capital B and a capital P. We never learned about it in school, but there was an attempted fascist coup in 1933. Smedley Butler, being a diehard American, said in probably more for formal terms, fuck you, but they right. didn't do it. But I was just thinking, like, there's an example <laughs> to the point where they wanted to use this guy to overthrow FDR. It is kind of, it's Epolito and Caracappa. It's not the same, but it's kind of the same. But I was just thinking, like, oh, wait, there is an example of that happening. That didn't really have anything to do with this, but I had to get that. Okay. Hey, listen, I, if you don't mind, I want to just uh, tell your, you, you talk about Crooked Brooklyn and now 
friends of the family. Mm-hmm. I, I have two short stories that I did, and I think you guys, your 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 audience would would really like both of them. Okay, they're on they're on Amazon. Um, they're probably Kindle shorts, but there might be uh, you know you can read a Kindle story without having a Kindle device. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Downloading it. One of them is called "Handed a Killer," and uh, and the other is called called "Murder on the Bridge." And they're both cases that um, that I did, and I think that um, that they're not mob cases, but uh, they're interesting in the sense that they are there's there was a reason f- uh, for the killing on the bridge, and there was a reason for this the hand of the killer. It's a the killing of a young mother on her way home from from shopping, and what happens in it's in the middle of, of Crown Heights uh, during a time when there was a lot of um, a lot of turmoil between the uh, the black and Caribbean community and the Jewish community and and she was killed by a um, by a, a Caribbean uh, guy and and it, it, the way that we did the case and what ultimately solved it I think will will really uh, fascinate your uh, your audience so that one and the and the other case the murder on the bridge was coincidentally another young Jewish girl who was walking, trying to lose weight on the Williamsburg Bridge and is encountered by a junkie. And, um, and to me, and, and I know this is going to sound kind of uh, hokey, but to me, he was like the personification of the devil come to Brooklyn for what the way that he did and what he did uh, to her and to ultimately also his best friend who he, he used and then killed believe it or not, to, um, to get away from, to get, to get out of what he had done. And, and the way he gets caught is also interesting because there's someone who was close to him who betrays him. And, um, and the way it's, he's betrayed is interesting. She thinks that the cops are asking about murder number one. Instead, they're asking about murder number two. And she starts talking about murder number one. And they say, what, what are you talking about? we're not, we're not looking for him. He did that too. And, um, so, so murder on the bridge and handed a killer and they're both on Amazon 99 cents. You really can't do a, uh, can't it, it it's all costs for each let's, one of the stories. Well, but, uh, let's, let's do, uh, let's do an episode for each of them. Uh, I'd be happy to, cause that's cool. Tom, it's a great, they're, they're terrific stories. And, yeah. and I, put, I got to tell you that there are two cases that I really kind of, put my heart and soul in, in terms of, uh, of the investigation as well as the trial. And, and they all have, they both have an interesting twist to them that, um, that I believe, I really believe your listeners and your, the readers will, will love. So anyway, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. That sounds awesome. Send me the links for those and we'll set up some dates to do them. I, I will do that. I'll do that. Yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, you, you let me know when you want to, and I'll be back. I, I, sure. I, talking to you so um, yeah man i love having you on dude you're a cool guy as i tell everyone this is a one-man show when i invite guests on there's no charity guests there's well he keeps having that guy on because the owners i have on people who i want to have on so if you're on the show it's because i like talking to you and if you're not on the show i don't know you know do the math so (laughs) it's, it's pretty simple but um yeah man you're a badass guy i love having you on thank you for your time i did see you're on don the pleb don's a cool guy i hope you enjoyed that yeah, yeah. i did i did yeah. i did to hear from him again he wants yeah. to, he wants me to come back and talk a little bit more about the um about the bot the body snatcher so yeah, uh, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit so don's uh, as real as they get don's a badass it's cool all, all right, right man, man. Well, Have thank a- you, Mike. Uh, book will be in the description, stick it in the top comment. It's a fantastic read. It's absolutely terrifying. I wouldn't blame anyone if you just want to keep your head in the sand or if you want to dive deep into it, go get it. It's badass. You can play it on your phone. You just use, go to general settings, accessibility, spoken content. You can get your phone to read it to you. But aside from that, it's a great book. Description, stick it in the top comment. And Mike will be back with those two short stories. Take care. Bye-bye, Tommy. All right, man. You have-